morning, everybody. It's great to see everybody bundled up a little bit this morning. Maybe we have a warm heart and keep everybody warm as we praise God this morning. We'll hear from Brother Derek as well. But the more we sing, the more hot air we put out, the warmer it's going to get. Comments went some on that. <laughs> Thanks, David. We'll just sing a couple songs this morning. Our God, He is alive. Supper this morning. Let's turn to page, I have it marked right here, page 196. Page 196. Glory to his name. Thank you. 
so rich and sweet, cast thy poor soul at the sinner's feet. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet, cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. interesting little inspiring article the other day and I thought it would be good to read this morning. And if you're like me, there's nothing quite so entertaining as watching a good swashbuckler movie. You know, you see the pirates swinging from there and their sword play and all the excitement. And a lot of those swashbuckling movies, if you'll remember back in the day, were Robin Hood series. Well, everybody loves Robin Hood, and although Robin Hood might be a bit of a mythical figure, good King Richard was actually a real person. You know, Winston Churchill said that when King Richard's contemporaries called him the heart of a lion, they paid a lasting compliment to the King of Beasts. Little did the English people know that they would owe him for his service, and heavily did they pay for King Richard's adventures. He went off on his great crusades, and during his 10 years as King of England, he was only in England twice, and only for a few months each time, for that 10 years worth of time. But my thoughts here are not for his life, but in more the manner of his dying. In 1199 A.D., there was a dispute over some treasure in France. And so the king of England went there, and he laid siege to the castle Schultz in France. And he was wounded in the shoulder by an arrow during that battle. And gangrene set in, and he knew that he was going to be dying soon. So that he arranged matters in accordance with the principles by which he lived. He divided his, his property, his treasures, everything he had. He gave some to his friends, some to his relatives, and he gave more than half of it out to other people as charity. Yes, good King Richard was a good king. The thing that most interests me on this, though, is that for seven years prior to his death, King Richard had not been to confession, because, of course, in 1188 A.D., most everybody was Catholic at that point. And not being to confession, because he didn't want to confess some of his sins. And, of course, not going to confession means that you can't take Holy Communion. So for seven years, he didn't go to confession, and he didn't take communion. But in the last weeks of his life, he decided that he needed to change his ways. And one of his biggest sins that he didn't want to confess was his hatred for King Philip of, it, of France. He hated King Philip, hated him with a passion, went after him every chance he got. But in his last few weeks of life, he decided he needed to forgive King Philip. And not only did he forgive King Philip, he also forgave the archer that shot him. He would put, put into prison. He was ready to die. But King Richard the Lionhearted said, no, this man will not die. He pardoned him and gave him a portion of his treasure to live out the rest of his life. You know, many, many of us don't want to confess certain sins. We have the secrets in our heart. But God said, confess your sins to me, and you will be clean. You know, Richard, King Richard played up being a man. He hid his sins 
He thought he had it from God, but you can't ever hide your sins from God. But in the end, he confessed his sins. He got to take one last Holy Communion before he died. So if there's something in your life this morning that you want to confess to God so that you can have a pure heart as you take communion, think on that as we have our silent meditation and then a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your son that you sent down here. He lived, he died, he died in a horrible way. But he had to die so that we could one day be with you. And we thank you for that, dear Lord. We pray at this time as we come and take the communion that we'll have a pure heart. Come before you happy and ready to join you in heaven one day. We pray that you'll always be with us help us to have that heart that confesses our sins. Help be with our minds at this time. Help keep our thoughts on your son who did die for our sins. I pray that you'll bless our taking of the loaf that represents his body and the cup that represents his blood. I pray you'll bless our lives always. In Jesus' name. Come up and take it and then return to our seats.
Chilly morning. Good morning. There's a tithing meditation today. I'm going to read a little bit from chapter 7 of Hebrews. Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and that's my uh, Melchizedek, uh, king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. We must now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, the father of all of us, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi, who received the priest's office, have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. Abraham was one of the few human beings that actually talked to God. God talked to him. God protected him. God loved Abraham. If we love our fellow man and our church and if we have faith in our God then it's our duty to tithe it's our duty to share the things that we have with our brethren God owns everything. God gave us everything that we have and everything that we receive to enjoy the things that we enjoy. God expects us to share with our fellow Christians. And we share because of our faith in God, we share in the things that we receive from God. Father God, we're so thankful that you loved us so much. You sent your son Jesus to free us from the sins of this world. He frees us because of our faith in you. Our faith in Jesus as your son. The fact that we believe that you are the one and only righteous God. We pray that our tithes and offerings will be used to the benefit and the welfare of our fellow Christians. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Seats out. Yeah. yeah, there was a short empty row in the front that wasn't exactly six feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think? Let's 
things work out all right. The top part, you stretch his legs out now, so. All six feet of him. <laughs> okay, we need to go down the uh, praise list here. Steve's granddaughter was baptized last week. That's a blessing. It was an honor to have his family here with us too. Wish he had done different reasons for it, but good to see him all together. Dick and Susie are doing better, I understand. I'd like to, not maybe be here today, but I uh, told the weather that it will take a chance. Dave's got a new job. Yes, I did. Started Friday, continuing Monday. Great new adventure. Great. And Carrie got a new dog. I did. <laughs> Laying between her feet out there. <laughs> Good looking little black lad. Okay, prayer requests for the Beagle family. Barbara, because her sister passed away. Tom Asher's father needs prayer. Johanna's friend, Darcy. There's Lyme disease. You know how she's doing? She's doing a lot better. Her, her teeth are good. She's staying alive. Uh, Carrie. Sherry's daughter, sister in law, has COVID. And Lawrence is still fighting that Bell disease. Heather, Susie's daughter, needs prayer. Amy Sloten needs prayers. And Tom Asher's son, Kyle, needs prayer. We have prayed. He got a job. Good. Yes. And uh, Dean Pierce needs prayer. Jack's brother-in-law, Walt, who lost his wife, needs prayer. Jeff, Susie's relative, and Susie's grandkid, Brimley, both, both need prayer. We need to continue to pray for the Stockmans. Jack and Vicki, Susie's friends, needs prayer. Doris Allen, and Janet's friend's husband, they both need prayer. David Bell, Becker's regret religious relative, needs prayer. Jerry's mom and his brother both have COVID. They are both recovering, and uh, actually, uh, my mom's recovered, and uh, she's over the swine flu thing. Randy Kellogg needs prayer, as well as Louis Larson. And Jack's son, Joe, he's doing a little better. Joe, Susie's brother, had a stroke. And we need to pray for the states that have had this bad COVID. I have a praise. Jenny and I get to go down this afternoon to the county fairgrounds. We're going to get our COVID shot today. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I, I would like to thank everybody, and my family would like to thank everybody for everything that the church did for me, my family, and so many reasons. We appreciate your prayers, and uh, it meant a lot to the family to uh, allow us to have this service here.
Also, we need to continue to pray for Wilma. My ex son in law went that way down and got a lung shot. He had trouble with his thyroid. They took out a parathyroid from one of them in the arm, and he had to take a lot of calcium every day because of that. So there's nothing funny about it. Anybody else? Let's pray. Dear God, we want to thank you for all that you do for us and for our country. We pray that you will be with the leaders of our country in setting up a, a congressional, congressional bill that will get the uh, money to the people that need it for the unemployment and for the COVID disease. Again, I want to ask you to be with Roma and the other ones on our prayer list and be with Derek as he gives our service today. In God's name I pray, amen. Next month. Start singing. I just wanted to mention something about. Uh, got the little blue blue songbook here. Um, it's a little different than our blue songbooks. This are special selections. When I was 11 years old, I got this songbook. We had gone to a church uh, weekly camp out, a vacation Bible study, when I was 11 years old. But our church sponsored it for about eight years, but. This particular year was the second year of the camp out, and we were going to sing out of this book. And so my parents bought one for mom, one for dad, and one for me. And mom laminated them, put my name on the top, and mom's name on the top. And it was the first songbook I ever got, was this songbook. And so I carried it with me for years. I wanted to sing out of that this morning. I'll fly away.
Bibles to the book of Genesis. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and we thank you for all your blessings. Pray that you would uh, teach us this morning what you will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 30 and starting in verse 25. Um, we have a lot of text to cover. We have the rest of chapter 30 and 31. So, <laughs> um, but I'm going to divide it up for you so not read the whole thing in the beginning like I normally do. Jacob, you know, he had served Laban for 14 years. He worked 14 years for both of his wives. And now that the 14 years was over, he was ready to go home to Canaan. And uh, of course, after that 14 years was over, you know, uh, Laban didn't remind Jacob that your, your time is done. <laughs> um, Jacob had to be the one to go to Laban and uh, remind him that his that he had finished the work that they had agreed upon, and he was ready now to head home. So let's look at, uh, starting with verse 25. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me on my way so I can go back to my own homeland. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and I will be on my way. You know how much that, how much work that I've I've done for you. So you know Jacob, he was he was homesick. He longed to see his parents. You know when when Rebecca sent him off, she thought it was going to be a quick reunion. You know, go there for a little bit, get a wife, and come back. Well, so far it's been fourteen years, and he isn't back yet. And so, you know, he's, he's homesick, he's ready to see his family, he's ready to go back to his homeland again. He has no intention, you know, of staying in Haran. Um, not only because this isn't his home, but also because, you know, Laban isn't exactly the best father-in-law. Um, and this isn't the promised land, you know, God had, had come to him and told him that he was going to inherit, you know, what his father Isaac had inherited, what he had inherited from Abraham, that God had given them a special land that they were to inherit. So, you know, God had promised him the promised land, and this wasn't it. So he was a stranger here. He, he was a, a foreigner, and his heart was somewhere else. You know, and like Jacob, you know, our, our heart also should be somewhere else. It shouldn't be here on this earth. Uh, we also are foreigners, Scripture says. We're aliens. We're strangers of this place. And uh, our hearts should be longing to, to go home. You know, it might take a few years before we get home. It took uh, Jacob 20 years before he was able to actually return home. Uh, but he finally made it. Um, but we also should be longing for our home whenever God decides to call us back. Verse 27. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, please stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. He added, Name your wages, and I will pay them. Now the King James says, I have learned by experience. But the New American and uh, the NIV more accurately translate this divination. And we know from chapter 31 that Jacob worshipped many gods. Uh, so, you know, he used some sort of, some sort of divination to, to determine, you know, that the Lord had blessed um, 
had blessed Laban because of Jacob, and this was true. Um, so God was probably behind that, letting him know no matter what means that he used to, to figure that out. But uh, really, both of these ideas are true. You know, he did, he learned through experience, you know, by, I mean, it's been 14 years now that he's been, uh, that Jacob has been working for him. So, you know, he learned through experience that God was blessing him. And because he was in that sphere that he was getting blessed, um, but also because of, of, of the means that he used. And God had promised Abraham, and later Isaac and Jacob, you know, that they would be a source of blessing to all those that they came in contact with. And uh, we learned earlier through the life of Isaac that Abimelech, remember, was blessed because Isaac was in that, in that area where Abimelech was, and he learned by being around Isaac, that he was being blessed because of Isaac. And later, we're going to learn how everyone that Joseph comes into contact with is blessed. Potiphar gets blessed through Joseph. The people in the prison get blessed through Joseph. Um, Pharaoh and basically the whole country or whole, um, you know, all of Egypt is blessed because of Joseph. Because God's working through Joseph, so um, so Laban is being blessed because uh, because of J Jacob's presence. But notice, you know, he didn't want Jacob to stay because of his family, or because he married his daughters. <laughs> um, no, he wants J Jacob to stay because he's lining his pockets. That's why he wants him to stay. You know, he was motivated by, by selfish desires. Um, his wealth, you know, had come because of, because of Jacob. And um, he doesn't want his good luck charm to go away. You know, he doesn't, you know what, he doesn't want him to, to leave. Uh, verse 29, Jacob said to him, You know how I work for you, how your livestock is fared under my care. The little you had before I came has increased greatly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I have been. But now, when may I do something for my own household? Now, the last two bargains, you know, that, that Jacob had made with Laban, they were really in Laban's favor, weren't they? You know, Jacob had volunteered to work for Laban for seven years to receive Rachel, but this was actually a lot longer than what was, you know, the normal custom. And then after Jacob was tricked, Laban talked him into working another seven years. Um, so, you know, Laban thought that maybe, you know, he was going to get another good deal out of uh, making another bargain with, uh, with Jacob here. So he asked Jacob to name the price. Um, so Jacob, you know, he doesn't answer right away, and it's probably partly because he's been tricked by this guy before. He was a little bit cautious, um, and so this time, you know, he's careful about the answers, and so first of all, he points out to Laban, basically kind of gives his resume, so to speak. Uh, he reminds Laban of what a hard worker that he is. He says, you know how hard I've worked for you. Um, and, you know, Laban had been a witness of this, like I said, because Jacob has been his employee for 14 years now. And, you know, good help doesn't come around like this every day. And so Jacob is reminding him of this. But Jacob also reminds Laban of the kind of care that Jacob gives to his livestock, you know, that, that he cares for the sheep and the goats like a, like a good shepherd would. Laban doesn't need to worry about anything as long as Jacob is out there because um, Jacob cares. He's a good shepherd. 
He knows a thing or two about shepherding. I mean, he was a, a shepherd for years and years before he ever went to Heron. Before he ever worked for Laban, he was a shepherd. So he's been in the business for quite a while. He knows what he's doing. Um, so, you know, Jacob can be, be trusted. And then um, Jacob reiterates, you know, basically what Laban has said, that God has blessed him because of Jacob. And, you know, this truth also needs to be considered in the negotiations, you know, because Jacob acknowledges that God's hand is at work in his life. And Laban also knew this. Um, God had promised that he would be with him and that he would bless him. He would go wherever that Jacob went. He would watch over him. And lastly, Jacob says to Laban, But now, when may I do something for my own household? So, you know, for the last 14 years, Jacob has basically been providing for Laban's household. You know, Jacob and his wives, they were given the necessary provisions. You know, they probably were given lodging and, and food to get by. But, you know, they want, he wanted to take care of his own family. He wanted his own place and be able to earn his own wages. You know, he didn't, he didn't want to have to live with Laban for the rest of his days. So, you know, he was glad for his two wives, but now it was time for him to, to move on. Verse 31. What shall I give you, he asked. Don't give me anything, Jacob replied, but if you will do this one thing for me, I will go on tending your flocks and watching over them. Let me go through all your flocks today and remove from them every speckled and spotted sheep, every dark-colored lamb, and every sp spotted and speckled goat. They will be my wages, and my honesty will testify for me in the future. For whenever you check on, my wage, on the wages that you pay me, any goat in my possession that's not speckled or spotted, or any lamb that is not dark colored will be considered stolen. <clears throat> so Jacob didn't want to be in Laban's debt, you know, because he still wanted to leave at some point. And, uh, you know, he didn't want to be cheated again. He had his fill of uh, Laban's deceptiveness. So, so Jacob thought of a way that God would be the one in control of how much he got paid, not Laban. You know, whatever God deemed him worthy of or merely, you know, by his grace, that's what Jacob would receive. And... Uh, Sheep were mostly white, and the goats were mostly black. So the number of speckled um, goats or speckled or spotted sheep, you know, they usually, this was a very small number usually. So essentially, Jacob tells him, Laban, you know, you take the best of the best. You take the, the big percentage. I'll just take whatever's left over. You know, those spotted sheep that come out, you know, those will be mine. You can have all the, the pure white and black um, goats and sheep. Um, so Jacob, you know, he was hoping that God's hand would be in this because God had promised, you know, to bless him. And so he's hoping that God will look after him and that if he says, you know, I'll just take the speckled and spotted sheep and the goats that, that God would provide for him. So he, he really has quite a bit of faith by doing this, you know, because he, he is saying by making this agreement with Laban, you know, that he, he's trusting in God to watch over him. And uh, also, this was a good agreement because Laban could be sure that nothing dishonest was going to go on, right? Because Laban could check. He could go out and check his flocks, you know, and if there were any pure white sheep in them, he would, have, he would know that Jacob had stolen them from him. So everything was on the up and up. Um, and uh, verse 34 said, uh, Laban said, agreed, let it be as you have said. The same day he removed all the male goats that were streaked or spotted, all the speckled and spotted female goats, all that had white on them, all the colored lambs, 
and he placed them in the care of his sons. Then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob, while Jacob continued to tend to the rest of Laban's flocks. So Laban knew this was a good deal. You know, it was, it was too good to pass up. And he was sure, you know, that he could take advantage of Jacob by doing this, or he wouldn't have agreed so quickly to it. Um, and, uh, but he was up to his old tricks, wasn't he? You know, as soon as they made the agreement, he goes out and he gets rid of all the speckled and spotted sheep, gives them to his sons, has them take them three days away, so that Jacob can't find him. So Jacob starts out with basically nothing. Um, he has nothing to start with. So anything that uh, he's going to own has to be whatever sheep and goats are born in the future. So, you know, Laban hasn't changed at all. And... Uh, so the odds were really against Jacob now. He had nothing to begin with. But again, you know, God was sovereign over the situation and he was working behind the scenes. No, no challenge is too big for God, as we'll soon see. Um, verse 37. Jacob, however, took fresh cut branches from poplar, almond, and plane trees. And he made white strips on them by peeling um, the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. And when the flocks were in heat and they came to drink, they made it in front of the branches. And they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted. And Jacob set apart the young of the flocks by themselves, but made the rest face the streak and dark-colored animals that belonged to Laban. Thus, he made separate flocks for himself and did not put them with Laban's animals. And whenever the stronger females were in heat, Jacob would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so that they would mate near the branches. But if the animals were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban, and the strong ones went to Jacob. And in this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. So this is a really weird passage of scripture. <laughs> Probably one of the weirdest in all the Bible. Uh, what, what are we to make of all this? Well, I want to. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, options here. <laughs> option number one. Um, option number one would be that this is kind of like the Mandrake story that we talked about a couple weeks ago. You know that um, Leah's son went out and found these Mandrake plants, and they supposedly. Um, would enable you to get pregnant if you had them. So it was kind of a superstitious thing. Um, and so one option would be that that's what Jacob is doing here, you know, that what he's practicing and doing has some sort of roots in superstition. You know, that whatever the, the females saw at the time that they were mating, that that would have an effect on their offspring. Um, so that's one possibility. Uh, option number two is that maybe God gave these instructions to Jacob to increase his flock. Um, now there's a glimpse that this might be a possibility because over in chapter 31 and in verses 10 to 12, Jacob is talking to his wives and he says, in breeding season, I once had a dream in which I looked up and I saw the male goats mating with the flock that were streaked, speckled, and spotted. And the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. 
And he said, look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled, and spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. So we know that God gave him this dream about the streaked, speckled, and spotted animals. So God may have also given him instructions in that dream as to how he might receive those speckled, spotted animals. Uh, sheep and goats and that what he actually did was an act of faith and obedience to what God had told him now you know God often gave strange instructions to people um, and it was partly to see if they would respond in faith right he told the Israelites to walk around the walls of Jericho once every day for six days and then on the seventh day they walked around it seven times and at the end they shout and the walls fall down now that's really strange instruction to give to somebody uh, in order to bring walls from a city down right uh, <clears throat> another another example would be Naaman God told Naaman to go to the Jordan River and dunk in it seven times and after the seventh time his leprosy would disappear that those were strange instructions uh, once Jesus spit in the dirt and made some mud and he put it on a blind, a blind man's eyes and he told him to go wash it off in the pool and when the man went and washed it off then he could see so there's, you know, there's some times where God has, gives instructions to do something, and a lot of time it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's partly, am I going to do this in obedience? And God rewards the people when they act in obedience. So we know that God gave Jacob a dream of these streaked, speckled, and spotted flocks. We know that an angel came to him, and also it talks about that God was aware that he was being mistreated by Laban. So it's possible that God gave him these instructions uh, to gain advantage over Laban. Or it's also possible that Jacob just did this purely from some sort of superstitious belief. But either way that it happened, you know, God's hand was in it. You know, if it was a superstitious thing, it wasn't because of the superstition that Jacob was blessed by these animals, right? Um, Jacob prospered because God wanted him to prosper, and that's the bottom line. So despite whatever attempts that Laban had made to keep on cheating Jacob, God was making sure that uh, Jake was, Jacob was going to prosper. Uh, chapter 31, verse 1. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all his wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So Laban's sons were just like their father, you know, <clears throat> twisting the truth and, and making a lie out of it. Jacob hadn't taken any of Laban's flocks. Just because Jacob's flocks had prospered, um, they were reproducing and he ended up having a larger uh, flock than what Laban had. You know, this was God's doing. It wasn't because Jacob was, was stealing them. Uh, they were just, they were envious of Jacob, you know, and they, they hated him for it. And uh, Laban was growing cold towards him as well. It says that Laban's attitude towards him was not what it had been. So, you know, it must have been really bad because before it wasn't very good. So if his, late, if his attitude had cooled, then now it must be really bad. Um, and, you know, sometimes God allows trouble in our lives to get our attention. Sometimes he allows trouble to come to prepare us for something that, that's next. 
You know, and he removes those comfortable things in our lives so that when he tells us something to do, we're ready to take action. And uh, this may be hap what was happening with Jacob, you know, because God was wanting Jacob to leave. So he's making it more and more uncomfortable for Jacob so that when God tells him to go home, you know, he doesn't have to fight him on it. He's, I'm ready to, I'm ready to leave Laban and his sons, and I'm, I'm ready to, to do what I need to do. So God, God tells him, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. <clears throat> Verse 4. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah to come out to the fields where his flocks were. And he said to them, I see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it has been before. But the God of my father has been with me. You know that I worked for your father with all my strength. Yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages ten times. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. And if he said, the speckled ones will be your wages, then all the flocks gave birth to speckled young. And if he said, the streaked ones will be your wages, then all the flocks born, uh, bore, streak, bore streaked young. So God has taken away your father's livestock and has given them to me. In breeding season, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw the male goats mating with the flock that were streaked, speckled, and spotted. And the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. And he said, look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled, and spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. Then Rachel and Leah replied, Do we still have any share in the inheritance of our father's estate? Does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he has used up what was paid for us. Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belongs to us and our children. So do whatever God has told you. Then Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove all the livestock ahead of him, along with the goods that he had accumulated and paid him Aaron, to go, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. So uh, Jacob discussed these things over with his wives. You know, he wanted to get their input before leaving, which was a good thing. Um, after all, you know, this was the only place they knew. They lived there all their lives. And, um, but Jacob was wanting to return to his home, and God had given him instructions to do that. So he meets with them out in the fields, you know, so they could have some privacy. He doesn't want anybody uh, connected with Laban to hear what's, <laughs> what they're talking about. And so Jacob tells them, you know, first of all, that their father wasn't treating him like he used to. And uh, he talks to them about the times that, that Laban had cheated him, changing the agreement again and again with Jacob, going back on his word, you know, and continually just changing the terms of this contract that he had with Jacob. But he also pointed out to them that God's intervention that God had said to them, I have seen all that Laban has done to you. And, you know, it must have been a, a great encouragement to Jacob, you know, in those dark days that, that God was omniscient. You know, that he, he was realizing one of the aspects of God, that he's omniscient. He hears everything. He knows everything that's going on. He sees everything. And um, that God was going to help Jacob get back on his feet. You know, God was in control. So it's comforting to know for us as well that God is on an omniscient God. You know, he knows everything. Um, so, you know, in due time, God is going to make all things right. Just as he did with Jacob, God will make all things right with us as well. 
we might get discouraged from time to time, you know, because um, just like Jacob, people seem to get away with a lot of things. Um, injustice seems to happen quite a bit. But God sees everything, you know, and there's going to be a day of reckoning. There is. And God's going to make all things right in the end. Now, in some cases, we might have to wait to heaven before we see that. But he will make all things right in the end. And that's the good thing to remember. And so Rachel and Leah, they're on the same page with, with Jacob here, you know, because their father has mistreated them just as much as he has mistreated Jacob. You know, Rachel couldn't soon forget how her father had swapped her for Leah on her wedding day. I mean, you would never forget that. And um, they, told, they told Jacob how Laban had cut them out of the inheritance. You know, they said that they were treated like strangers from their, from their own father. You know, he was always so busy making money and thinking about money. He didn't have any time for his daughters. So he sold them, and then after that, from what they said anyway, it seems like he didn't really care too much about them at that from that point on. And uh, also, some of the money that, that Laban had received from Jacob's labor over the 14 years, that should have been given to them as part of their, their dowry when they got married, but they didn't receive any of that. So again, you know, when it comes to, to Laban, you know, it was just, it was all about greed. He didn't care about his son-in-law, Jacob. He didn't even care about his own two daughters. But Rachel and Leah, you know, they realized also that God had blessed Jacob. And that they were being also blessed, you know, by being married to Jacob. So God was enriching them, you know, in spite of Laban. And they were encouraged, you know, and they just said, go ahead and, and do what you think is best. Whatever God told you to do, we'll go with you. You know, so they're, they're on board with this whole thing. And uh, Jacob must have been relieved, you know, that they were, <laughs> they were on the same page with him. They were just as frustrated by all the deceit and everything else. Verse 19, when Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household gods. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him that he was running away. So he fled with all that he had, and he crossed the Euphrates River and headed for the hill country of Gilead. And on the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled, taking all his relatives with him. And he pursued Jacob for seven days, and he caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. Then God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream at night, and he said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Jacob had, pinched, had pitched his tent in the hill country of Gilead when Laban overtook him. <clears throat> and Laban and his relatives camped there too. Then Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You have deceived me. <clears throat> You've carried off my daughters like captives in war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me? So that I could send you away with joy and singing to the music of tambourines and harps. You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You've done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you, but last night the God of your father said to me, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you've gone off because you longed for, to return to your father's household. But why did you steal my gods? So they head off towards Jacob's home. Uh, verse 17 said that Jacob put his wives and his children on camels so they wouldn't have to walk. Remember, this is over 400 miles. So uh, he puts his family on camels. So that was nice that he was thinking of them. And uh, 
You know, he had 11 sons at this point, and Reuben was only about 12, and Joseph was, was six. So even there, there's only a six-year spread there. Remember, he had four wives having the babies, so they were able to get 11 kids out in six years. Um, but most of the kids are still pretty young at this point, and uh, so... He had accumulated uh, quite a bit of wealth at this point so that he was able to purchase some camels. And then, uh, you know, Jacob only took the things that were his. He didn't take anything that was Laban's. He didn't take any of, Lab of Laban's animals. Uh, Rachel, however, stole something. She stole their father's household gods. Now, we're not sure why Rachel stole them. Uh, we know that previously in one of the stories that she had prayed to Yahweh to have a child. So we know that uh, Jacob must have taught her about Yahweh and that she was praying to him. But she also grew up in the household of Laban who worshipped these gods and that was the house that she was brought up in. So she may have also um, worshipped and pray to these other gods. So she may have taken them for that purpose, that uh, she thought if she took them, then she, she still wanted to worship these gods. That's That could be why she stole them. She might have also stole them just to get back at her dad. You know, after all, this is the one that her dad swapped her with the other sister, and uh, she's leaving, so he can't do anything, so she figures... Oh, I'm going to get back at him so she steals the thing that he knows, she knows that he is precious to him. Um, also, uh, something else that might be a reason why she took them, they, they could have been worth a lot of money depending on what they were made out of. You know, sometime I, sometimes idols were made out of something precious like silver or gold or something. So um, maybe she was just stealing it for, you know, the, the worth of the value that they had. But for whatever reason, it's kind of disappointing to know that she did take them. And uh, it caused a lot of trouble for her husband, too. So Jacob, he sneaks away. It's kind of like what happened, you know, when he left Canaan. You know, he had to sneak away when he left his homeland. And now he's sneaking away from Haran here, right? But he, he feared the wrath, the, the wrath of, of Laban, just like he when he left, he had feared, you know, Esau's wrath. But uh, he got a three-day start because Laban was off shearing the sheep. But it, even with a three-day start, it was still slow goings, you know, because he's got 11 kids. And they're probably wanting to stop every five minutes to go to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, you know, and also Laban, he can just ride hard and fast, you know, with his servants. They don't have all the baggage of the animals and the children and all of that. So it didn't take very long for them to, to catch up um, with Jacob. And it is, it is a possibility that, that Laban might have meant to kill Jacob. Um, but... God gave him a dream during the night. He intervened. And this held back Laban somewhat anyway. He was still really verbally angry with Jacob. Even though God had told him, don't say anything to Jacob, good or bad. So he didn't follow God on that. But, but um, maybe it had planned to kill him. So he might have held back his anger at some point. But he, he still confronted Jacob, and uh, <clears throat> God was keeping his promise to Jacob. We see that again in this, in this little instance, because Jacob is, you know, his life could have been in danger, but God intervenes. He gives Laban this, this uh, dream, and uh, he, he's protecting Jacob. Now, most of what Laban says here to, to Jacob is pretty ridiculous, right? Uh, Jacob isn't stealing Laban's daughters. He worked 14 years for those girls. <laughs> you know? 
Uh, and they were leaving because they wanted to, you know. They, he wasn't forcing them to go. Remember, he talked to them. They wanted to go. They were tired of blaming themselves. They were encouraging Jacob to go. Um, and, uh, and the idea, you know, that, that Laban would have given this big going away party, that's kind of ridiculous too. Because he never would have let them go, as you can see in this story, you know. So chasing them down. So, you know, that's very unlikely as well. So they really had to sneak off, you know, in order to just get away. And also, from what their daughter said, their father didn't really even care for them that much. And it wasn't probably so much that he was losing the daughters as that he was losing his profit. Jacob was leaving, and the blessing was going with him. And that's probably why he was mostly upset. Uh, and then he also falsely accuses Jacob of stealing his household items, even though he doesn't have one ounce of proof that it was Jacob that took them. But he just accuses them because they were missing. Verse 31. Jacob answered Laban, I was afraid because I thought you would... Take your daughters away from me by force. But if you find anyone who has your gods, that person shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, see for yourself whether there is anything of yours here with me. And if so, take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants. But he found nothing. And after he came out of, of Leah's tent, he entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them inside her camel's saddle, and she was sitting on them. And Laban searched through everything in the tent, but found nothing. Rachel said to her father, Don't be angry with me, my lord, for I cannot stand up in your presence. I am having my period. So he searched, but he could not find the household gods. Jacob was angry, and he took Laban to task. What is my crime? he asked Laban. How have I wronged you that you would hunt me down? Now that you have searched through all my goods, what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of all your relatives and mine, and let them judge between the two of us. I have been with you for twenty years now. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts, but I bore the loss myself. And you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or by night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night. And sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for the 20 years that I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks. And you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would surely have sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. So Jacob had had his fill with Laban, you know, and uh, Laban goes in and he searches everyone, and uh, he says, if you find, you know, if you find anybody that's guilty, you can kill them, which he shouldn't have said that because he didn't know his wife had stolen them. Um, but... Rachel wasn't caught because she was a chip off the old block. She deceived her old man. So again, the deceiver was deceived. Um, so then after all of that, Jacob just unloads on Laban here. You know, he, he's had his fill. 20 years with this guy, always deceiving him. And uh, he's just frustrated. So he explodes on Laban and... Jacob told Laban that, you know, he, he was a good shepherd. He cared for all of Laban's sheep. 
He made sure that all the births were successful. You know, he hadn't taken any of, any of Laban's animals and eaten them. Um, he was a good employee. You know, he was someone that Laban could trust. But Laban never treated him right, no matter what Jacob did. No matter how good of an employee he was, Jacob never treated him right. And he always took advantage of Jacob whenever he could. And if any of the animals were wounded by wild animals, he said, he said, I took the loss. Some wild animal came and one of the animals got wounded or was killed. Jacob, it, it came out of his pocket. And if any of the animals were stolen, Jacob was always the one that was blamed, he says. And that also came out of his pocket. And not only that, but then Laban kept changing Jacob's wages, you know, to benefit Laban. Uh, and finally, he says, you know, the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac had not been with me. You would have sent me away empty handed. And I'm sure that would have been the case. So he says, but for God, he has seen my hardship and all the toil of my hands. And last night, he has rebuked you. So Jacob, he brought it out all out in the open for everyone to hear. And everyone knew that this was, was true, especially Laban. Verse 43. Laban answered Jacob, The women are my daughters, and the children are my children, and the flocks are all mine. All you can see is mine. Yet what can I do today about these daughters of mine, or about the children that they have born? Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took a stone and set up a pillar, and he said to his relatives, gather some stones. So they took stones and they piled them in a heap, and they ate there by the heap. And Laban called it Jager. Saw Hadutha, and Jacob called it Galid. Jacob said, This heap is a witness between you and me today. That is why it was called Galid. It was also called Mizpah, because he said, May the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other. If you mistreat my daughters, or if you take any wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. Laban also said to Jacob, Here is this heap, and here is this pillar that I have set up between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not go past this heap to your side to harm you, and that you will not go past this heap and pillar to my side and harm me. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So jo jo Jacob took an oath in the name of the fear of his father Isaac, and he offered a sacrifice there in the hill country, and he invited his relatives to a meal. And after they had eaten, they spent the night there. And early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and he blessed them and he left and he returned home so Laban is basically exposed before everybody but he, even at the end here you know he's still trying to save face right he's he's twisting everything again acting like he's the victim here um, you know he's, he's saying that everything Jacob owns is really his again you know, and it just helps us get in his mind and shows us how messed up his thinking is, right? He thinks that, that uh, you know, that uh, Rachel and Leah are, are still his. Jacob had worked for them for 14 years. And these weren't his children. They were his grandchildren. They were Jacob's children. And all that Jacob owned, he earned over all those years. But finally, Laban settles for having a, uh, this, this covenant between them. 
And the terms of the covenant were basically that Jacob would be a faithful husband and that there would be peace between the two men, that they couldn't cross the, this line that they were drawing in the sand. And so they piled up these stones as a monument to this covenant. And, Jake, and Laban called the monument Jager Sahudutha, and this was Aramaic for a monument of witness, is what it means. And Jacob called it Galid, which basically means the same thing in Hebrew. Laban also called it Mizpah, meaning to watch or to witness, saying, May the Lord Yahweh keep watch between me and you when we are away from each other. And so then they offered this sacrifice, uh, kind of con confirming this covenant that they had made before God. And Laban kissed his daughters and grandchildren, and he headed home. You know, sometimes God puts Labans in our life to uh, refine us and reshape us. Uh, Laban, you know, he was really a mirror of Jacob's former self, right? The person maybe that Jacob would have turned out to be had God not got a hold of his life early on. And God used Laban to show Jacob just how ugly deceit was. I mean, he really learned a lot about deceit, even though he was a deceiver to begin with. He learned about that, and he learned about selfishness, and also Jacob learned all along that God was in there. God was working for him. So, you know, Jacob, he got a good look in the mirror over those 20 years, and uh, he had to deal with all these evil schemes that Laban was constantly throwing his way, all this dishonesty, all this painful experience. It really reshaped Jacob's character. It made it, him into a man of honesty by the time he was through. He was, he, his character was formed and shaped by God through this evil man who was really a reflection of his former self. So also through all of this, Jacob learned to depend on God. I mean, he didn't have anybody else. Laban was always out to get him, and he had to turn to God. And so he continually was depending on God, and God was continually um, reaffirming his covenant with him, that he was watching over him, that he was intervening in his life. So, so Jacob learned to, to put up with someone who was continually mistreating him, and uh, it put him in the hands of God. He had to just rely on God for everything. And also, he learned to continually take the loss. Have you ever been in a situation where you had to be the one to continually take the loss? Well, that's when Jacob was giving his speech, that's what he was saying to his father-in-law, you know, that I always had to take the loss, you know. And he let God be his avenger. He didn't ever do it himself. He let God be the one to be the avenger. He let God be the one to vindicate him and prosper him. And God did. God worked in his life, and he, he made his flocks prosper, and he became more wealthy than Laban. But it wasn't because Jacob was trying to scheme and deceive and get his way anymore. It was because he finally let God be the one to prosper him and promote him. And so despite of all the injustice, you know, um, Jacob was learning so many lessons during this time. Even though it was a hard experience, it helped him to really grow up. And uh, he learned that God was always watching, that God was aware of everything that was going on. And Jacob he needed to remember what God had promised him back, back at Bethel. And what God promised him was, he said, I am with you, I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will not leave you until I have done all that I promised. So, forget about Laban, you know. Forget about man's schemes. 
everything that man is doing to bring you down. Forget about all of life's troubles. Basically, God was saying, because I'm with you. And I'm not going to leave you until I've done everything that I've promised through your life. And for us, we have very similar promises, right? The Lord Jesus told us, I will never leave you or forsake you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And Paul reminds us, be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Very similar words to what God had promised Jacob. We have those same promises. God is going to intervene in our lives. He's going to be with us. He'll take care of us. Doesn't mean he's going to wipe away all the troubles and problems. But he'll work in those problems to mold us and teach us things. Most of all, to teach us that we need to depend on him. And that he will take care of us through the ups and downs, through all the things that happen to us. But we need to remember to learn to rely on him and not to try to control our situation, not to try to use our manipulative ways to deceive people to get our way. But let God be the one to get in there and control everything and to, if he wants to promote us, if he wants to prop, prosper us, let him be the one to do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, this text. And, and even though it has um, <clears throat> some things that we don't quite understand in it, Father, we get the overall message, and that's that you are in control, that you love us, that you care for us, that you're watching over us, and that you have the power to intervene in our lives and to do whatever it is necessary. Sometimes you allow things to come into our lives to help us to look into our own mirrors, to see a reflection of what we need to see, changes that we need to make. <clears throat> but most of all, we learn that we need to depend on you and that you promise that you will always be with us until the very end, that you will be with us and perfect us until, until the day of Christ Jesus. So we thank you for those promises, Lord. Help us to trust in, the, in them. Help us to trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Please stand as we sing page 98 in Red Book. 98, I surrender all. Of course, a family of God, please. I am so glad. 